So today's topic um, is climate crossroads, path towards a just transition and clean economy. Our guests are uh, Helena Barecki and Paul Werner. Um, Helena woke up to the need to be part of the climate uh, action during the fire season of 2017. She is passionate about movement, health, and how humanity can re-become a positive part of our planetary ecosystem. Taking part in the march, um, the 2019 March for uh, Climate Action Project leadership training uh, served as a springboard for the volunteer climate work she is uh, currently doing with CRP and the San Francisco Climate Emergency Coalition and Sunrise Bay Area. Um, Paul was introduced to the problems of climate change in 1993 when as a chemist he helped identify the problems of and solutions to um, GHG emissions from the semiconductor industry. Since 2003, he has been investigating the problem of how to transition to a sustainable society. And after retiring a few years ago, has focused on advocacy for policies to addressing the climate crisis. Um, so let's welcome both of our hosts now. And thanks for also thank them for um, taking the time to present uh, with us today. Okay, hello everyone, I'm Paul Wormer. Um, I really started to get interested in the climate change issue some years back uh, when I was thinking back to a summer science project I'd done in high school in 1970. And that was looking at the impact of the temperature change of in Narragansett Bay on uh, plankton in the bay waters. And just a very small temperature had a major change. Um, so some years back, I did the climate reality project training and the climate reality project uh, is an Al Gore uh, headed uh, foundation or nonprofit that focuses on educating people about climate change. And recently, as more and more people are recognizing it's a problem, they've been piloting the idea of local action with policy action teams who work locally on trying to make changes. Um, I got very interested in that because that's a chance to move the needle at a local level, which is a lot easier than moving it at a national level. And um, that's what's led me here. And I'll pass over to Helena at this point. Thanks, Paul. Um, I also want to thank Nate and Bruce for inviting us to do this forum. This is really exciting. I really appreciate all of you for coming. Um, as Nathan said, I am a climate activist for a variety of reasons. Um, I also did the Climate Reality Project training. I did it in 2019. Um, and right now for me, the pollution situation looms really large. Um, I grew up on the peninsula back when we had pristine air pretty much 365 days a year. Um, and the first time I remember having trouble breathing when I went out for a hike was probably about five years ago. I, like you saw the smoke rolling in and all of a sudden I was coughing. Um, and it's just gotten worse every year since uh, with this year's apocalyptic orange sky in October and the air quality still spiking over 150 um, every time there's been an inversion layer this December. Um, my brain just is screaming, this can't keep getting worse. And I know that we in the Bay Area don't have it as bad as the Central Valley or other places in the world. Um, so I've been a reduce, reuse, recycle and bicycle girl for many years, but I realized that wasn't changing the systemic problems and I had to do more, which is when I found the Climate Reality Project and sort of segued into other things as well. Um, I, I really believe we've got to join forces to save all we can, um, so here I am. Uh, I want to thank everybody who gave input on our survey um, for this presentation. I wanna say all of you who are attending here have a breadth of positive action already taken and a real breadth of perspectives. I said I'm a cyclist and I want to explicitly welcome the car lovers among you and uplift that no one solution is a panacea. Um, not every useful change is gonna work for every human or in every situation. I like the way projects 
have an echo going on in here. Hmm. I like the way Project Drawdown describes it. Um, sorry, sorry, just a moment. The solution is to implement a wide variety of carbon emissions reducing and sustainability increasing solutions as quickly as possible and as widely as appropriate. Um, we've done our best to weave the topics you brought up in the survey into our presentation, um, but I also really hope you stay and add your thoughts in our discussion um, at the end of the presentation. And I'll pass it back to Paul. Okay, so you probably know, since you're here, a bit about climate change and the science behind it, but I'd like to do a short refresher. Um, what we have is the greenhouse effect, where sunlight hits the earth, some is absorbed and re-radiated as heat, and the greenhouse gases absorb that heat and re-radiate it back towards Earth. Basically, sunlight is equal to energy, which is equal to heat, and the greenhouse gases make the atmosphere act as a blanket, which keeps the heat from radiating back into space. Uh, it takes a while, just like when you're cold and put on a blanket, it takes time to warm up. When the greenhouse gases go into the atmosphere, it takes a long while for their impact to show up, for the heat to build up and be noticed. And part of that is a lot of that heat goes on into the oceans. Uh, and what we see on this next slide is a slightly different focus. There's been lots and lots of talk about the global surface temperatures but most of the heat goes into the oceans. And what you see here as the increase in the heat content of the ocean over a period of, I wanna say 55 years is roughly paralleling what we see with the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. They are clearly correlated. Um, on land, the land dries as it gets warmer, causing drought. Um, but the oceans, when they warm, well, water also evaporates from the, from the oceans. That means more atmospheric moisture, and that means when it rains, it can be a lot heavier. Think of Hurricane Harvey in Houston, or you get stronger storms. Think of Typhoon Goni this past year, or the hurricanes that we've had recently, which have intensified so very rapidly, like Irma, Maria, or Dorian. And we know that it correlates with the burning of fossil fuels, as you see in this graph, tracking the change in atmospheric carbon um, from about 1850, when we started really using coal in heavy ways, all the way through 2019. Uh, burning fuels are the biggest source of greenhouse gases, um, but they're not just greenhouse gases. Burning fuels has many health impacts, uh, cardiopulmonary and neurological, major impacts on both children's development and the health of seniors and the mental acuity of seniors. Indoor air quality in homes with gas stoves and gas heat, even worse homes with wood, wood stove heat frequently violate the clean air, st air standards, or they would if they were outdoors, but there's no quality standard for indoor air. So other greenhouse gases that we'll probably need to be aware of are things like um, 
the fluorinated compounds, refrigerants and fluorocarbons, very convenient materials, but significant, significant greenhouse gas problems. And two others, nitrous oxide and methane, both of which are produced naturally, but human activity can dramatically increase the amount of production that occurs. I mentioned earlier that there are health impacts and climate change is recognized as a serious medical problem. Um, infectious diseases, heat stress, air pollution, uh, waterborne diseases are all influenced by a changing climate and they're not influenced in our favor. So I'd like to just toss out a question if you'd answer in the chat. What are some other problems uh, that you might see with uh, the general global warming? And I'll wait a few minutes before discussing that. So yeah, please okay. go ahead and toss your ideas in the chat. If you're calling in, you can also um, unmute and say something out loud. Climate refugees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, climate refugees is part of what we're seeing in people coming up from Latin America is that that's uh, an area in Guatemala, Nicaragua, and Paul, help me out with the third country. That's Honduras. Honduras, yeah. right triangle. And there's drought so that people who were farming the land and living you know, from what they produced can no longer live and they gotta go somewhere. That is a huge part um, coming up from Latin America and also um, what's going on with hurricanes flooding people out and displacing people either within countries or outside of countries. So I also see noted that uh, the global warming impacts poor people and those who have done least to cause the problem. And that's true globally. It's the, the climate refugees as were referenced uh, from Latin America but it's also, for example, the inhabitants of the uh, Mississippi Delta, whose land is washing away thanks to the aggressive uh, sea level rise and uh, hurricane actions. The floods in the Midwest of this country. Um, so it's, it's, it is a significant social justice, environmental justice issue uh, as we understand that the impacts on communities and especially low-income communities are extremely severe. Thank you for all of your chat comments. They're all really um, important to think about. So, this is clearly a problem with a lot of impacts and we need to focus on solutions. And to focus on solutions, one needs to get some sort of an understanding of where are levers we can move, where are problems that we can address and solve, that we need to address and solve. So in San Francisco, for example, we can address things that happen in the city. And I'll give a shout out to San Francisco Environment for actually doing some rather good data publication, gathering and analysis. So this slide shows the uh, emissions by various sectors in San Francisco. Uh, the direct emissions from buildings, from transportation, in particular methane from landfill, and then municipal is a combination of the city's use of uh, both buildings and transportation. They've parsed it rather strangely there, but they're talking to city agencies. So that's, I think, why they came about it that way. 
Um, let's see if I missed something here. What that shows is we've been generating about 5 million tons of car CO2 equivalent emissions per year for quite a while. Um, we've gotten a lot better. If you go back and look where we were in 1990 to 2018, we've gotten a lot better because the electricity used in the Bay Area has been cleaned up. Uh, a number of, of pieces of legislation have influenced that. And so, for example, many of us can now have zero carbon electricity. But we've run out of the easy changes, which is making the electrical grid cleaner. That's happening, but that'll only take us so far. The big problem with this is that the transportation and buildings, which are almost 90% of the total, are fossil fuels, natural gas, diesel, gasoline use in the city. Um, how this breakdown looks will depend very much on what city, what town, what county you're in, in California or across the country. So take a moment and think, and again, if you'll toss some answers into the chat, why do you think it might be that you'll see a lot of variability in this, uh, this breakdown of the direct emissions in any given locality. I'm seeing land use, commuters, total population. Government regulation, density. Yeah. And I saw availability of transit, which is a big deal. Yes, age of buildings, urban, rural. Absolutely. So there are, there are a lot of variables that we need to think about as we're planning on how to address this. Okay, so San Francisco has used this as a start. Uh, they've identified building electrification as a solution. Um, about the same time that a, lot, a number of us were saying building electrification is needed. Um, and uh, the good news is the technology exists both to provide renewable electricity for buildings and to use it very efficiently in buildings. Uh, using, for example, things like heat pumps for space heating and space cooling. It's actually very nice. You put in a good heat pump system and you get air conditioning and heating out of the same equipment. Very efficient. Uh, heat pump water heaters. And in the kitchen, a lot of people are freaked out about how will I cook without my gas stove? And the nice thing is the induction stoves are vastly better than any gas stove. And if you're curious, there's some great YouTube videos you can hunt out on induction cooking. Oh, go ahead and fill your own, like you've been using one for like five years, right? I've been using one for five years and I would not go back. Um, there are other things that uh, let's see, let me go back up. So we know we can do it, but there are not non-technical challenges. I bought one five years ago, and five years ago, they were not inexpensive. Um, I suspect that they are still a slight premium over the, the El Cheapo electric or cheap gas stoves, but the people who are most worried seem to be affording Viking ranges, so they don't have much to... Uh, to, to grumble about on terms of price. Uh, but that does point out that there are non-technical challenges, uh, sort of the just transition social justice aspects of it. Uh, uh, individual versus communal approaches. There's only so much one can do individually. Uh, utility investment decisions are a big deal. I am paying a premium for my 
uh, 100% renewable electricity because PG&D is allowed to charge me for long-term contracts they made for fossil fuel-based energy. And you've got protection of marketplaces by the oil and gas industry who are actively uh, working to block legislation to electrify. Uh, more walking, biking, as this, this identifies under transportation, more walking and biking is essential. And San Francisco has set some pretty ambitious goals, as you can see, 80% of all trips to uh, walking, biking, and public transit. That's a big shift they're trying to do. So San Francisco environment is responsible for developing the strategy in San Francisco. Unfortunately, like many agencies tasked with doing important things, they are tremendously under-resourced. They actually don't get any general fund revenues. Uh, and they are very subject to the mayor mayoral approval and direction for their actions. And uh, depending on the mayor, that can be uh, a blessing or that can be an obstacle. We talk about waste, and that raises another issue, which is the issue of consumption-based emissions. Um, so by consumption-based emissions, we mean all of the emissions that are wrapped up in the products we buy. And I think I'm gonna jump ahead here to the next slide to put it in perspective. That 5 million metric tons is roughly scaled in that little blue circle in the upper right. We're looking at about a, almost 22 million metric tons out of the consumption-based emissions. So the direct emissions are a small amount. We can deal with electro, uh, direct emissions here, but how do you deal with stuff before it gets here? the production, the transport, and also the disposal, ultimate disposal of waste, even if we recycle their impacts. So a question for the chat again, who needs to deal with uh, these consumption-based emissions? Is this something do you think individuals alone can do? Is it something business will do? Is it something that needs government involvement? Thoughts, comments? This is a big one. This is a very challenging question. All of the above. We all need to consume less and government needs to do things, etc. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Education, mm-hmm, and societal commitment as well. Yeah. Carbon tax. Thank you. Thank you all for your comments in the chat. Um, So um, San Francisco is currently developing its climate action plan, and it is actually taking a serious look at consumption and equity concerns, which is great news. Um, it talks about energy, transportation, and buildings, but also packaging food, soils, landscape, and where and how we can afford to live. But a plan is only as good as its implementation. And at this point, as people have pointed out, many needed actions like building retrofits to all electric are either unaffordable or inaccessible to most residents. Um, regarding public transit, even before COVID, we had problems taking it because of connectivity and time constraints, even affordability for some trips and Uber pool is cheaper than Caltrain. Um, now with COVID, um, huge question, public finances are even more strained um, and people have health concerns. 
taking public transit at this point. I do take Caltrain twice a week to take care of my dad, but I have to admit it's super stressful to stand with my bike and keep a watch, making sure nobody is near me who doesn't have a mask on, making sure I'm near the door so I get air if there's anybody without a mask. Luckily, it's been getting better with the masks. At first, it was pretty scary. Um, but, but that's a huge concern for people. And that's a concern that's really valid and may not be um, like that may be hard to overcome. And we need to figure out how to do that and make people actually safe. And then the third question, as people have pointed out, is uh, in comments like consume less and we all need to do something is how do we get our society to value sustainability and repair over convenience and novelty? I'm thinking single use items and fast fashion. It's a big, it's a big part of the um, total greenhouse gas emissions in fact. Um, Paul. Okay, so we've got clearly challenges ahead. Um, where do you think we're going to see the biggest barrier? Again, this is a, a question for the chat. Let's see what's there. Where do you think we've got the biggest barriers? Where do you think we've got the biggest opportunities? And I'll pause for a moment. For instance, does anybody think the technological problems are really the hardest in terms of getting down to uh, very low carbon emissions? Biggest challenge is capitalist economics. <laughs> yeah. Um, so economic system that we currently have. Political will. Mm-hmm. Profit and survival of many people who will lose jobs and how do we make a just transition is totally key. Social media, how do we deal with that? Short term thinking, vested interests, all of that, yes. denial. Yep. Yeah. And I think I think I see the false promises of plug and play solutions. And that's clearly a big thing. People are looking for a solution. That there's this one thing we do and everything gets better. And that's not going to happen. Okay. So these socio-political and economic issues are incredibly interactive. Uh, think of the battles over the stimulus money, the incredible amount of money in direct and indirect funding of fossil fuel subsidies. Um, the funding of science is highly politicized or has been. And on the solution space, there is a tremendous amount of vested interests who are uh, battling. Uh, there's, there's a tremendous pressure to find ways to enable the continued profitability of highly centralized high tech, i.e. Uh, nuclear power plants or strategies to keep fossil fuel plants uh, survivable through things like carbon capture and storage. Um, and a lot of focus on how do we preserve our economic space? So those, those, those are problems. The good news is... So I'm thankful that nobody thought that the technical problems were um the hardest because they aren't. Um, in terms of total energy, enough solar energy reaches Earth every hour to fill all the world's energy needs for a full year. 
Um, and wind is many times what we need for the year as well. Um, it's a, been a question of how do we harvest that energy and store it? And those solutions are getting so much better and more cost-effective that they're actually cheaper than, um, than the fossil fuel options at this point except for the curve of building the new um, power plants, right? If you already have an existing gas plant or something, you don't have to build it. So that messes a little bit with the economics, but if we can invest in the right thing, um, we can get the energy we need without a problem. Um, Paul, the next slide. So coal, oil, natural gas has followed um, our economy for the past about 150 years. And it's contributing, if you remember, 80% of the greenhouse gases. So we have to transition off of it and we can because we have solar, wind and um, as Paul has that lovely diagram up there, the green hydrogen, which can actually be produced from solar and wind power um, to, to make it. And that can be used for fuel sources, for things like airplanes, which we don't really have a way to charge them mid-flight at this point. Um, we, we need to transition all of our power use, not only the electric grid, but also as Paul was saying, the buildings and transportation to uh, zero emissions energy. Um, and we can do it. It will just take um, investment. And once we do it, we have gotten rid of 80% of our current greenhouse gas emissions. And the other 20% is mostly agriculture and land use. And we do also have the know-how to reduce or even reverse those emissions by building soils and using regenerative agriculture and land restoration techniques. Um, so the technology is there. Now what we need is for communities and businesses and governments at all levels to work together to implement the most appropriate solutions for a given area that meets people's needs and climate constraints. Um, so I, I, I'd like to add that not only do we have the technology, it's none of it new. Uh, the solar photovoltaics date back to the early days of space flight. So that's at least 50 years old. We're what, about 130 years going on uh, on wind, uh, wind generated electricity. Not only that, are they old and well established technologies, they're cheap. Um, there's the levelized cost of energy. And this is an analysis that looks at what does it actually cost to generate a watt of energy, of energy by various means, coal, gas, solar. And the renewable costs are plummeting uh, at amazing rates. New plants for solar and onshore wind are cheaper than operating coal plants and cheaper than building new gas peaker plants. So it's cost effective to make this transition. Thanks, Paul. So, um, Investment is key. And even for what we do in San Francisco, we can't change alone. We need support from the state and federal government. Only the federal government can print money to invest. Um, but San Francisco and other cities play an important role in piloting projects that prove the transitions can be done and incentivize further uptake of a green and clean and healthy economy. Um, what we now have to do is get constituent and people power to overcome the lobbying dollars for the fossil, from the fossil fuel and other opposed industries. 
and bring people on board, convince people who are working in fossil fuel industry, et cetera, that we can build a just transition to a better future. And these, these just transition issues are not simple. Uh, someone made the question earlier about, for example, the people who lose their jobs, how, we de how do we deal with that? There's a lot of stuff to work on. Yes, and people are working on it. The picture you're seeing is of an organizational sign on letter that the San Francisco Climate Emergency Coalition's campaign for all electric new construction um, sent to the Department of Environment, to the Land Use and Transportation Commission, and um, to the Board of Supervisors as a whole as well. Um, and notice the joint forces of local and national climate groups, justice and health organizations, and professional groups, as well as clean energy think tanks like RMI, Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, all of this, plus direct citizen action, calls and letters to multiple committee meetings um, was necessary to convince the supervisors even to do the first step of all electric new buildings. But we got it done and the collaboration goes multi-directionally. For example, you see Earth Justice and Sierra Club up there. Um, they lent us their clout for the San Francisco ordinance and we are lending them our voices on a continuing call and letter campaign for statewide building code improvements with the California Energy Commission. Next slide. So, okay. So, yeah, Helen, do you want to? Yes, you sh you should be taking this. I'm sorry, I lost track. Yeah, I didn't know if you wanted to say anything more about what's been done already on local and state action. Well, yeah. So let me let me do a recap. California has actually made things a lot easier. I mentioned early the low earlier the low carbon electrical supply. And Senate Bill 100, SB 100, was passed in California a few years back, which mandated that by, I think it's 2045, all electricity in California will be from a zero carbon source. And local organizations, for example, in San Francisco, the Clean Power SF Community Choice Aggregation um, Group, has set a time scale for having uh, beating that by uh, 20 years. It's, um, and uh, the technology is there. In public transit, SFMTA, the, uh, the Municipal Transit Agency, has a um, electrification plan to convert all of their buses to uh, electric, either the electric trolleys that we have now, or um, battery hybrids or fuel cells. San Francisco in 2019 passed a climate emergency resolution declaring that it was an emergency and they passed a ban on using natural gas in any new or remodeled municipal buildings. And in October, I'm sorry, November of this year, we finally, after well after a year of advocating, uh, got the all electric uh, new construction ordinance passed. Um, we now have an executive order from the outgoing governor, or from the, actually, I shouldn't say the outgoing, from the previous governor, Brown. Uh, requiring carbon neutrality by 2045. There are challenges with that uh, because there are a lot of complexities that haven't been mapped, but the California Energy Commission is, uh, is looking at that and paying attention. And it's a multifaceted set of activities. Um, I also wanna point out that um, our current governor, while far from perfect, has set out an executive order for protecting 30% of public lands by 2030 um, in line with the sustainable development goals of the UN um, and also his uh, mandate on phasing out uh, sales of gas powered vehicles. Um, so uh, as we've talked about, the work ahead is multifaceted um, and the, the top 
issue really is just transition. Um, how do we convince people that a clean future is better than the status quo when they're scared? Um, and I wanna clarify that by just transition, we mean both labor concerns and people who currently work in fossil fuel and related industries and racial and economic justice. Um, in the ordinance we passed for all electric new buildings, we tasted both of these. In that case, um, the environmental justice aspect was clearly aligned. Bolded SF and Emerald Cities were our allies because of the air quality and the affordability benefits, especially in low income communities of color. But labor concerns did almost derail the ordinance. The pipe fitters who put in the fossil gas infrastructure opposed because they stood to lose jobs if the new building boom was all electric. But because of the public momentum we generated in favor of the ordinance, they came to the table and worked out a solution that required the city to look into expanded water recycling. They lay the pipe for that too. And in the end, they met with our coalition and actually wrote a letter of support that said this ordinance could create a blueprint for the whole state where labor and the environmental community could work together instead of in opposition. Um, and that's more of what we need on the just transition, really making sure that um, low income communities of color are made whole and that their lives get better with any ordinance we put in rather than doing unfunded mandates, which for instance, might displace somebody and that the labor community um, keeps the important work that they need. Um, and I'll let Paul continue. Okay, so clearly as we convert to an all electric world, there's gonna be a big impact on certain job categories as the oil and, oil and gas jobs go away. Um, similarly, EVs are much lower maintenance and higher reliability, which means a lot of automobile mechanic jobs, uh, service station jobs are gonna go away. That hasn't been talked about as much because that's not a highly unionized uh, uh, population, but it's important to recognize that. Um, the flip side is that there are going to be job gains. In San Francisco alone, we've got nearly 400,000 units of existing housing that need to be retrofitted. That's a lot of skilled work that needs to be done. And there are opportunities to start training up the workforce to do this because the existing work labor force doesn't exist. Um, there's the need to train people. One of the big problems that's been identified by the uh, uh, contractors who are already doing work like this, folks like Sean Armstrong of Redwood uh, Energy, who does a tremendous amount of low income, all electric construction, is the difficulty of getting the skilled contractors and even getting the equipment because the supply chain is not capable of meeting higher demand. So this is gonna to have to ramp up. Um, I wanna give a shout out to our supervisor, Gordon Marr, who is well aware of this. He's paid a lot of attention to this retrofit problem. Uh, and has also recognized the need uh, for employment. So we are, we are through those groups working with the jobs with, just, uh, jobs with Justice folks, making sure we're understanding concerns and opportunities uh, to develop a uh, skilled workforce uh, recruiting from the low income communities. Transition costs are gonna be large. Um, a lot of impact on low and middle income communities. In some areas, such as the Central Valley or the Sierras, electrifying an existing house makes a lot of sense because they're using air conditioning all summer and heat all winter, and the energy savings really help offset the cost of the conversion. But those of us who live in the very mild California coastal climate uh, Helena was pointing out that she hasn't turned on the heat in the entire time they've been in their apartment, just putting on sweaters. Um, it doesn't 
the energy savings don't repay the capital investment. So we need clever strategies to do with that, to deal with that. Um, we also need to make sure the work is done cleverly. Uh, there are a lot of quick and dirty jobs in the construction remodeling trade that we see. If we don't do it well, it's we're going to get a very bad reputation because not because the technology isn't capable, but because the people who are doing the work aren't thinking about it, don't understand the challenges, don't understand the the uh, the uh, the subtleties because it does heating with the heat pump systems requires a different approach to do it cost effectively than using gas. It's just, just the way it is. Um, let's see, what are some of the other things? There are huge opportunities. Uh, again, uh, the Central Valley, Sacramento, Modesto, they're not gonna see grid impacts because they're already using a ton of air conditioning in the summer. But the coastal communities, the electrical grid is not used to the high electrical demand um, that heat pumps will oppose. But the good news is it's an old grid. It needs to be improved. And we're learning about the risks of natural disasters on the reliability. So as we're upgrading, um, there's a chance to plan in resilience against things like the public safety power shutoffs uh, or seismic shutoffs. We need to plan for the transitioning away from natural gas because as fewer people use it, the cost of the infrastructure falls heavily on those who are still on natural gas. And right now in California, the price of natural gas on your bill is dominated not by the cost of natural gas, which is at amazingly low values costs, but by the cost of maintaining the grid and servicing the grid. And so we need to be talking about how do we develop good policies to address this? Not a trivial question. Um, there are potentially some answers, uh, but it's not clear that everyone is aligned on those answers as, as an economic possibility. So um, it's, it's an area that we need to pay attention to. Uh, transportation, again, we were talking earlier about vested interest. There's a tremendous push from the refineries to say, oh, we're gonna convert to biofuels. We're gonna use biomass to make uh, fuel for the trucks and the buses and the cars. But A, if you're using biofuels, you're still burning fossil fuels, which means you're causing many of the health hazards. Uh, it's not gonna be strictly carbon neutral. And you're putting an incredible demand on the existing biomass in the world. Um, and that results in habitat destruction, extinctions, land use change with, uh, with climate change impacts and water impacts. But there's a tremendous push for it by vested interests because they've already got sunk capital in the chemical processing. So we need to be aware of that. And Thanks, again, guys. sorry, one last thing is the consumption-based emissions. And I'll just mention that and uh, ask if people have thoughts on other things we're missing. Okay, so in terms of biodiesel, if it's coming from somebody's restaurant oil that's already used, that is great. The problem is that as more people start to use it, what happens is literally 
companies start cutting down rainforests to plant palm oil plantations to produce biodiesel, which not only destroys the rainforest, adds huge amounts of carbon emissions, reduces carbon sinks, and um, <laughs> and destroys you know the places where indigenous people might maybe living. Um, it also reduces the amount of land that's available for human nourishment. Um, so a problem that's been a problem with like uh, the the corn alcohol fuel in the United States that spiked corn prices um, and became a real problem for people who were li living um, on very low incomes. Um, so that is in a nutshell, my a description of the problem with biodiesel and, uh, and biogas. Paul, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, I think that summarizes it, ni summarizes it nicely and I'm happy to follow up offline if wanted. Yeah. So and the one comment I saw was meat and a question on hydrogen fuel cells. And the answer is hydrogen fuel cells, yes, absolutely a possibility. And, and meat is a question of production. Again, if you have um, a factory farm, that's going to be a horrible environmental impact as well as climate impact. Whereas if you have a, um, a regenerative farm where the cows may be eating things that th there are known types of plants that reduce methane emissions from cows and the cows can then, if they are grazing in a proper pattern, they can actually give the, um, the manure fertilizer for the soil that enriches the soil and helps things grow better. So meat is complicated. I don't think we can ever eat as much as we do right now, but um, it's not necessarily that no meat whatsoever is going to um, make things uh, better by itself. Um, with that, I'd like to go to a quote that is in the IPCC 2018 report that I absolutely love. Um, so I'll just read it. Equity, sustainable development, and poverty eradication are best understood as mutually supportive and co-achievable within the context of climate action. And this is the basic idea between the Green New Deal resolution, HR 109 nationally, um, and locally, I wanted to point out um, that with building retrofits, Poder SF and Emerald Cities, uh, both San Francisco-based organizations, um, have an idea for a clean energy buildings hub, which would be a multilingual and accessible, customer-friendly and comprehensive program for residents, restaurants, and other businesses, contractors, and workers to get the information, assistance, and training they need to go all electric which would help connect workers with contractors who need them and make this process both go faster and help people make a living, make it cheaper and easier through um, bulk purchasing um, programs for people to retrofit their houses and provide a way potentially for communities to make things simpler, less disruptive and easier by say doing a block at a time. It's an idea in the works, but if we could do that, it would be, Amazing. Um, yeah, I'm I'm really excited about the possibility to solve multiple problems at once. Somebody mentioned the. Um, I'm just going to take one point. Somebody mentioned that a lot of fossil fuel companies are also investing in wind or solar or green energy. Um, and you have to look at the details. How much more are they investing in new fossil fuel production than they are in wind? I would love it if all of the fossil fuel companies in the world turned into ethical green energy advocates. Um, I don't see it happening. And with that, I'll let Paul continue. Okay, yeah. 
So we've done a pretty good job on energy efficiency and clean electricity, uh, but getting the private existing private property to decarbonize is the big challenge. We've we sort of stopped it from getting worse with the new construction ordinance. It means the problem isn't isn't getting worse, but we've got to move forward. And the the especially the natural gas industry is fighting back with misinformation. Uh, uh, linking back to that induction comment, it's the woe to the home chef. Gas can be banned from new elect new San Francisco buildings. How will we cook without gas? Uh, we've got such wonderfully misleading statements as San Francisco can ban new natural gas because it destroyed the Hetch Hetchy Valley. Well, not quite. Uh, that's a Forbes article. Uh, and we have this very aggressive uh, tweet campaign from companies like Chevron and Shell um, that are implying they're doing a whole lot more than they actually are. Uh, they are, in fact, recapping some of the arguments that convinced me they were responsible back 20 years ago when I was paying attention to what was going on. So we get to the, will we change with the needed speed? So what now, what do you think might be the hardest obstacles to overcome for us, biggest opportunities? We've asked this before, but we'll recap it. Yeah, obstacles and opportunities, like they both exist. We don't, not, no one person sees them all. <laughs> so if you have ideas, please feel free, put them in the chat. Um, and well, I just want to say, I did see a couple of questions in the chat. One is about el electricity generated by fossil fuel undercutting the benefit of EVs and the electric environmental costs of producing new technologies, lithium mining, et cetera. And we'll get to that at the end of the presentation. Yeah. That's great. So people are saying that decision makers are starting to take notice that we need to change. There are a lot of jobs opportunities. Um, somebody said we need to nationalize or pick, take public control of fossil fuel companies. Um, there's, you know, fears about that. Global economy. The global economy is geared towards petroleum profits. Um, which is, as Paul said earlier, totally intertwined with the political will um, and how society feels about it. Mm hmm. Yep. Retrofits definitely can be challenging, especially in old buildings. And um, somebody said Norway might be an example for good business models. Um, I don't know. I'd love to hear more about that. Also Germany carrying the multiple problems of pandemic and debt. Yeah, yeah, San Francisco is in a good position to show it can be done. Um, and when I think about will we change with the needed speed, I think about um, how many people are aware and how many people are working together on it. So we have um, created, oh. I'm sorry, I'll go back. Nope, you can continue. I didn't know if you wanted to say anything about that next. I, I was gonna go into our reference document and post it, but. Oh, but no, go ahead. That's a good thing to do. Continue forward. So we need to work together for all of these reasons um, here strategizing, doing outreach to all parts of society, 
connecting and contacting elected officials. If you want to type in more things that need to be done in the chat, um, please do. I'm going to put our reference document in here, um, which has a list of groups you can join. It also talks about an event San Francisco Department of Environment is doing um, to talk about their climate action plan and get public feedback, as well as just a bunch of books and um, podcasts and web pages to find out more about climate science, climate justice, um, and climate solutions. Uh, so right here, that's the references, tinyurl.com slash climate crossroads. And Paul, you can go forward in the... Okay. And so um, I really think that if you're not already a part of a group and you have the bandwidth to be part of a group working on climate issues, um, a great way to start is to join a group. Paul and I are both part of the San Francisco Climate Emergency Coalition and the Climate Reality Project Bay Area Chapter. Um, those are great groups you can get into and be active pretty much right away. Um, and we also have a number of other groups listed in the reference document um, with just a note about them. Yeah. So have one, one other comment I'd, I'd like to toss in here about joining a group and also going back to the previous slide where we mentioned about how outreach to labor and business. Public outreach by the city or official entities is really difficult. They can send out a lot of letters, a lot of emails, a lot of tweets, and they don't really reach people. And organizations like Climate Reality Project, San Francisco Climate Emergency Coalition do outreach. And we're very effective at reaching people who are already engaged. And one of the big challenges and one of the really important things is for people who are interested to actually reach out and talk to their friends, their family, their coworkers, people in, at their school or their, their business, their neighbors, about what they're doing for climate change and why. Um, formal outreach to labor has, I've seen it tried several times in this uh, process that we've been going through with the, the building uh, electrification. And it's not been very effective. We're not able to talk to the people who need to hear us and we're not hearing what their concerns are. Nor apparently are the city, uh, the city uh, uh, agencies and officials. So this is one of those things where personal outreach is gonna be very, very important and even more so as we move forward. So that's a cry for help. Thank you. Okay. And so, yeah, let's general discussions. As we move on to the discussion, I want to just touch on one more thing that um, came up in the survey questions, um, just introducing the idea of making change, not at the city level or the state or the national, but within your own organization. Um, a lot of people mentioned making changes within their church, uh, school or workplace. Um, and I haven't done that myself, to be honest, but my guess is that the basic steps are the same as doing it at the city level. You have to gather a group of aligned people, look at the peoplescape and figure out what you can do now and what you want to build to for later. Um, know who the decision makers are and connect to somebody who's gonna be your champion among them. Talk to people who are undecided, figure out um, what their issues are, figure out how to make your plan better um based on their issues and then either win over or neutralize your opposition um and then implement your plan um and i know there are people in this audience who have also worked with their church um on on action plans so we'd love to hear from you about that too um you're welcome to put questions in the chat or if you want to make a comment or question out loud um, you can put a star in the chat. If you're calling in, we'd also like to make that available for you to, to speak up. 
So I'd, I'd like to deal quickly with a couple of questions that were came up earlier in the chat. One of them was saying converting to all electric is, is a good direction, but what percentage of the all electric is still fueled by fossil fuels somewhere else? The answer is it's an ever vanishing, ever, it's an ever smaller amount. Yes, fossil fuels are still big, both uh, existing coal plants, but they're, they're being phased out and natural gas plants. Uh, but the situation right now is an EV anywhere in this country is less carbon polluting than any internal combustion engine. And that's now across the US. So we've, we've crossed a line and it's only going to get better. Um, there was another question is about the environmental costs of producing all the new technology, uh, mining, processing, et cetera. And that is a matter of both regulation and corporate integrity in many ways. Um, there will be environmental costs. The question is, how they are, how they trade off against the benefits. Um, one of the big problems we have is the long-standing response is, well, we can't make money on that if we don't pollute. We can't make money on that if we don't do it, if we do it responsibly. And that needs to be challenged. Um, because it's clear that we can't afford not to change. And many of the folks are saying, oh, we can't afford to do it right, are saying, oh, we can't make the profits we'd like to make if we do it right, which is not quite the same thing. Um, in fact, 20 some years ago, many of the uh, chemical companies in the US uh, were part of a, a, a forum, a, an engineering forum, sustainable engineering forum. And they acknowledged that, yeah, if we did it right, it would actually be cheaper, it would be more profitable. But we've already invested so much in the wrong way that it's too difficult to change, too expensive to change. Um, since so much of this is growth and new stuff, the important thing is to make sure that the regulations are in place to make sure people are doing it correctly. And there have been starts on that and that needs continued focus. There have been a lot of comments in the chat um, about politics, both national and local. Um, I didn't see a question. Um, I, I agree with most of what's in the chat. <laughs> um, have, have we answered what you came here for? You can take a minute to think of questions too. Can I yeah. ask a question? Absolutely. Um, so let's see, we're, we're talking about just transition and how to make that happen on a, on a grand scale. Uh, we're mostly here talking about the city or Bay Area, but that extends out to the state and to the, and nationally also. Do you have any idea how that's gonna how, what sort of plans we have for bringing labor and um, the communities together along with our politicians to uh, make that transition, adjust, trend, make the idea of a just transition happen and uh, how, what it would mean to everyone and how and why we need to do it. I mean, I guess you're, explaining why we need to do it because of climate change, but to get that across nationally on a large scale, do you have any idea how that's going to work out, how, that, how we can go about that? So I think if you look at the um, work that the Sunrise Movement has been putting out, um, that's their main focus. Um, their mission statement is like, we are a movement of young people to stop climate change and create millions of good jobs in the process. And um, I think they've really galvanized the idea 
that all of these things need the the racial justice, economic justice, health care for all, and climate change are all part of the same problem. As somebody put in the chat about um, our capitalist economy, sort of putting money at the as the only measure of everything, rather than health equality, etc., being very hard to overcome with politics. And I feel like um, the Green New Deal and stuff that the Sunrise Movement and, and other groups has put out is um, moving in the right direction. And then nobody can tell the future in my opinion. So it's sort of up to us to head that way and see what happens. Paul, do you have? Yeah, so there are, there are, there are interesting things that are going on in various places. For example, in the uh, Bakersfield area, which are a lot of, a lot of uh, oil and gas wells. Um, one of the things you're doing is saying, okay, we need to shut these down, but we need to do it intelligently and safely. So people who used to be involved in making new wells are now being hired to go back through using the same skills training in the same area to safely decommission the wells and plug them. So there is a there are transition plans for existing workers related to shutting down the industry that they're in safely. Um, and that works for some of the workers, especially those who are older and uh, sort of mid to late career. Um, the, in Colorado, I believe it's in Colorado, there was a very good template that was being developed because they were closing down coal mines and what do you do for the workers in the coal mines in terms of what I will call respectful retraining? Um, there's been a lot of nonsense about, oh, well, they need to learn to code. And there's been a tremendous amount of hoopla about teaching people in the uh, Appalachians to code in these small villages. And indeed, some people have been very successful and, and, and loved coding and taken to it and made a success of it. But there are a lot of folks who frankly don't find that an appealing job and they're not suited to it. Um, we need to make sure that as we're developing transition plans, we understand that they need to align with issues of community, interests and skills, which is distinct from job training. Right, job training is you put this screw in this place, you drill this hole this deep and you put this much of a charge in the hole that you then detonate. Um, that's very job specific. The skill set that helps them do that is an entirely different thing. And so the challenge is going to be, and I think this Colorado uh, coal mine uh, just transition plan recognizes the importance of that. Understanding how you help trans people transition, what support they need for either relocating to areas where there are new jobs or strategies for developing new local jobs. Uh, it's not something that, it's something that the workers, the, the unions need to be directly involved with because it is so much a personal activity. But there are good templates that relate to managing the transition of decommissioning, not bringing in new people, et cetera. Thank you very much. Paul, do you, um, some people asked a while back, it came up a couple of times whether there are any cities that are model good model cities i know san francisco is considered by some to be um although from the inside it doesn't feel like it <laughs> oh i i yeah i i'd have to take a look lots of people are playing are playing in different areas so for example if you want to look at what's going on with transit uh London and the UK has a number of cities that have really been thinking about uh, the integration of, of transit and bike lanes and so on. And it's a very difficult 
situation, but I've been in London and have been just tremendously impressed at their bike network. Um, if you look at things like congestion charging, you've got cities like London and Stockholm uh, that have done a tremendous job of trialing them and, and giving people an insight into what works. This electrification stuff, I think actually we are probably pretty close to the cutting edge of. Although if you look at Europe, there have been really interesting technologies for building insulation and building energy efficiency, which are really important because if you do that, you might be able to electrify your buildings with the existing electrical infrastructure because you need to use so much less energy than you do use if you're using uh, gas heat. Um, related to that, I'm sorry, I'm just, the uh, things come to mind. There were some questions about, so what can people do locally to convert? And again, there's some references in the uh, resource document to both Bayren, B-A-Y-R-E-N, you can Google that, uh, which is a, this cross-governmental agency in the Bay Area that focuses on, on energy efficiency and conversions to renewable energy. They've got, they've got links to help you find uh, uh, energy efficiency consultants uh, who can help you figure out your own situation. Um, they've got links to rebates that are available in the various Bay Area counties, which are not the same across the Bay Area, which is unfortunate. You have things like the Pacific Energy Center in San Francisco, which does classes at all levels on energy efficiency, lighting, um, and, uh, and heat pumps uh, for both hot water and, and space heating. And they've got some that are just great for a homeowner who wants to understand what they need to be able to ask questions about. What we're starting to see, and this is really exciting, is um, 120 volt, 15 amp circuit devices for heat pumps for both heating and hot water. They're not widely available yet and more will be coming. Um, and there should be more information available early next year. Uh, there's a report that should be out, I'm sorry, early, th early this year, there's a report that should be out end of this month or in February. Uh, and I don't remember the source of that, I'm sorry, but uh, we'll uh, be happy to, I'll be happy to, uh, to, to respond to anyone who wants to chase that down. Um, and finally, right now, if you're an apartment dweller, there's not a lot you can do with things like hot water or space heat. Um, because they are involved cutting into walls or replacing capital equipment. But there are these uh, countertop induction cooking. So if you've got an, a, a gas stove you don't like or an old electric stove that is not making you happy, try one of these uh, 60 $70 induction burners, induction uh, cooktops that are available. Uh, you'd be surprised what you can get done with them. I think Helena has some good things to say about that. Yeah, I did. I, did. I had a gas stove and you, like you could smell there was a leak or something. Um, I got an induction cooktop, just a single burner because I'm just living with my partner and um, we don't cook that fancy. So one burner plus a toaster oven, microwave is plenty. Um, you do have to have a... a a pot with a magnetic bottom. So that's um, cast iron or stainless steel. Um, if, it, if a ma magnet sticks to it, it'll work, um, but it's super great. You can control the temperature uh, really, really clearly and quickly. I haven't burned anything since, <laughs> since I got the induction cooked up. Um, and once you get used to it, it's just faster. Like the, in the summer you're, apartment stays cooler, um, it, it's just really nice. That's my comment on induction stoves, I like them. <laughs> and I saw a question from Anne about what, how, who would you recommend for insulating a 100 year old home? 
and for there are so many things buried in that depending on where you live etc uh best bet would be go to bay ren and and look at their energy consultants and get a responsible contractor to do the work um, there, there are a lot of challenges so it's important to get a really good contractor when you do that Okay, ah, and what I didn't do yet, and what I should say is we have a survey, and I, it is, I, ah, excuse me, I gummed up here, I didn't put that into the chat. Uh, we have a survey that's at uh, the tinyurl.com, the previous one was Climate Crossroads. This is Climate Crossroads Survey, S-U-R-V-E-Y. So let me type that in and I hope my typing is clear. Um, slash. Thank you all so much for coming and for sharing the information and knowledge that you have. Um, I'm, I really appreciate it. And I copied the links that um, somebody put in regarding line three um, and some, and I think there were a couple of other things in there. So if anybody wants that, I copied that paragraph of chat. Yeah, and thanks, um, Helena and Paul, for taking the time to come and meet with us this Sunday and present. Um, if there, maybe we'll wait another moment if there's any other additional questions. Um, but otherwise, I think it's been a very um, insightful uh, presentation with a lot of uh, information about the ins and outs and sort of what needs to be done and how we can sort of jump in and try and help, even though the talk. The, the clock seems to be ticking sometimes faster than uh, faster than is comfortable. But maybe that's maybe that's the reason to jump in. Um, anyone else? Is there anyone who didn't? Um, oh, there, there's a comment. Well, we, we have access to the recording. Um, the recording, it usually goes online about a week after today. Um, if you're on the UUSF um, newsletter, it should, the link to it should be not this upcoming Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, it'll be live and linked, um, linked there. Um, and otherwise, I, you could just wait a week and then go to the UUSF YouTube page and it'll be, it'll be there. I just wanted to say, I just want to thank Paul and, and Helena also for the excellent presentation, extremely well done and very passionate passionate, um, your passion definitely comes across. Um, next week, uh, for those of you who are still on the call here, next week there's gonna be another related conversation. This is by the uh, UUSF Humanists um, on eco-humanism by Millie Phillips, who's a minister of the UU, in the UU community. Um, and that kind of a continuation of some of the aspects of the discussion that we're having today. So I want to encourage everybody to be part of that. We'll be putting that information out um, soon. And uh, I, I learned a lot through this presentation. Um, and I hope we have this conversation somehow will continue. Um, I'm sure it will. But, but, well, we'll find other forms, other other means to continue this conversation and inform as well. So, anyway, thank you all for being here and participating. The, the comments were really excellent. I thought. Thank you. Um, yeah. And thank you for the opportunity to present.
And Paul, thank you for taking the initiative to contact us <laughs> about doing this. So we're grateful for you to do it for you and doing that. And really grateful for both of you and bringing your, your knowledge, um, your knowledge and, and, your, and your, like I said, your passion to this conversation is really important. Um, I think it, I think it was a, a note of hopefulness, but also a note of realism, the difficulty that you know, we're facing, but there's real possibilities. I think the, the question about technology, which gets thrown up there all the time by people who are trying to, I think, prevent change from happening, I think it was really important that that was put in perspective. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, our next meeting will be in uh, two weeks and we hope to see them. For now, goodbye. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye all. Bye. Bye. Bye.